as far as the watering is concerned, I, uh, this this is another one of my personal Tom Toms. Okay, I'm always running around going, oh, you guys, you rely entirely on the massive California water projects, and you believe that we garden coming into the garden in April and go out of the garden in October because most people don't even believe it's a vegetable garden if it hasn't got a tomato in it, which is fine. But the only way you can do that is by the systems that we built that relied on the snowpack in the Sierras, okay? Otherwise, your summer garden would look pretty dusty. You'd be planting it real early, and its season would be very short. The only time where we have natural rainfall to produce a vegetable garden in this area starts in October. And that is actually the start of your vegetable season, okay? Because the nature only provides that you're growing a garden around here probably from about the middle of October, heading through to maybe early June. And after that, by nature, things have begun to dry out so bad that unless you're using water and pumping it onto the patch, you really can't grow a vegetable garden. So I encourage all of you to take a look at that, because especially if you think you're green and all environmentally friendly and all this stuff, okay, basically growing summer gardens isn't the most environmentally friendly thing, especially when we start to run out of water. Oh, and especially if you got a lawn in the front yard. <laughs> take the lawn out, then water the vegetables, that's better. But, uh, yeah, truly, and so you're not going to need watering systems much if you're growing during the winter months here. I prefer overhead irrigation. That's me. Uh, everybody's got their own answers and ideas on all of this. I don't like drip systems on garden vegetables. It doesn't mean I don't like drip systems. They're all right, and I use them, but I don't think they're that appropriate in general. The, that is, the, the, the quarter-inch drippers, uh, half-inch spaghetti tube things, you know, that you're always popping together like that. You know, for home vegetable gardens, the problems with them would be that, for starters, the vegetable garden is always come and go and come and go and come and go and come and go. Whatever there was last week is not there this week and so on. And so everything is constantly moving around. And it, it, so if you put drippers in, if they're in your perennial garden or in your, in your ornamental landscape, that works really good because nobody's moving the rose bush. It's staying there, you know. But in the vegetable garden, everything is always changing shape. That means you constantly have to be modifying your drip system. Okay, to be able to keep up with it. One. Two, usually nobody runs the drippers long enough to be able to soak an area around the plant. You have a tomato plant. It's in a four inch pot. You put it in the ground. You put a dripper next to it, right? In April or something like that. The plant starts growing. It doesn't take it but a matter of a month. And the root system is now the size of this table. Okay, that's a tomato. That's what they do. All right, they grow like mad. You got a dripper still sitting here right next to the stem. You're watering, the timer's going on, there's water coming out of the thing, but you're putting this little puddle of water right down here when most of the roots are out there. And it's always the feeder roots at the ends of the system are the ones that are taking in the most water and nutrients. So it gets very, very difficult to be able to try to keep the drip system in um, competition or in matched to the growth of the vegetable. The vegetable was essentially, from my point of view, too fast, generally, to be able to use drip systems on them. Now there is an alternative to the drip system, and it's Netafim. It's a half-inch black drip line that's got drippers built right into the line. Mm -hmm. So you haven't got any of this coupling stuff, you haven't got any drippers, you haven't got any quarter-inch quarter tubing, none of the BS, okay? It's just this half-inch stuff, you unroll it through the garden, technically, I guess, right down the row, usually when I've used it in the past, I zigzag it so that it's making a grid through the patch. So once it's turned on, the drippers, you can buy it on 6-inch centers, 12-inch centers, 18-inch centers, 24-inch centers for the drip patterns. They're built right into the half inch. Mm -hmm. You want to have it so that when it starts watering, that this circle, when it wets the ground, touches. The next circle touches. The next circle touches the next circle. That way, all the roots in your vegetable garden will be covered. And so if you're considering using drip, which is a smart thing to do because of water conservation, consider using netafim. Me, I believe in watering the leaves on many crops. That's not necessarily desirable on all crops, but on a lot of stuff, like say your snap beans, for instance. Snap beans get uh, mites, terrible problems with mites on a dry, hot year if the foliage is kept dry and dusty. But if you wash the foliage with overhead sprinklers, 
then what happens is the mites get knocked off on the ground. They don't do so well. Um, mildew, which is a terrible problem in this climate. Mildew, you know, and you get roses, you got crepe myrtle, da 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 da, right? You grow uh, zucchini, cucumbers, uh, melons, you experience mildew. Uh, peas, now this year I'm getting mildew on my peas in February because it won't rain. It's the water that keeps the mildew from forming. When I lived in the Midwest, I never had mildew. I moved out to California, I plant cucumbers, I got mildew. I go, what is, yeah, it's dry out here, what, that, why have I got mildew on my cucumbers? And then one day, I realized that it was the rain that was keeping the mildew spores from being able to adhere to the foliage. We get smashing thunderstorms. In, in Hawaii, I have 120 inches of rain a year on my coffee farm. I don't get mildew. We get every other disease you can imagine. But I don't get mildew. It doesn't happen. The reason we get mildew here, this is the biggest mildew factory on earth, is right here in the Bay Area, is because the, the mildew has a certain range of temperature that it loves to grow in. And that range is just about the temperature of Fremont. Okay, yeah, from day to night, winter to summer, we don't really fluctuate that much here, you know? Well, not a lot, and it, we're right in the middle of the range where the mildew loves to thrive. The mildew does like the night fogs, the dew that comes, and when the dew gets on a leaf, and in the morning the sun starts to come up, the day heats up just a little bit, but if the leaf is in the shade, it's perfect. It's just warm enough for the mildew spores to start to grow, mm -hmm. and the moisture on the leaf lets them begin to grow. But if you turn down the overhead sprinkler at that point, it knocks them all off on the ground, and they don't get a chance. Water hitting foliage disturbs mildew spores. Mildew is one of the worst problems in this area. I love overhead irrigation because it keeps away the mildew, and the spider mites are also awful. It keeps them away, too. Mm -hmm. Dry, dusty plants, spider mites love them. Mildew uh, loves undisturbed foliage. And so I, I actually use tripods like this goofy one here that have rainbird sprinklers on the end, and I just kind of move them around my garden with a hose on them, you know. And, yeah, and I just water everything that way. Um, but anyway, so Netafim for drip irrigation. Another way, a, a great idea this summer. It's going to be really dry, I think. I think. I might be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, it could start raining, in that case, we'll have mudslides. But uh, but it, it is to consider using what they do in the in the uh, American Southwest. The native cultures used to do what they uh, it was the depressed gardening. The Zuni called it a waffle garden, uh, where they actually planted the plants in depressions. Okay, so that it'll hold water. Um, the Hopi would after a rain the Hopi dig. Through the sandy dirt, they got, got the most, it's the worst looking place to live. I can't even imagine. Anybody ever been to the Hopi Reservation? It's just like, anyway. They <laughs> dig a hole down in the sand after a rain at the base of the mesa where water might have run off, you know, and they just dig and dig and dig until they can find moisture. And when they find moisture in the sand, they take the corn, they put it on the top of the moisture, and then they take a handful of dry dust and they mulch it with dry dust because they got plenty of that. <laughs> and, and, and that seals the moisture in over the corn kernel, okay? And the corn will germinate down there in the bottom of that hole. The hole could be up to a foot and a half below the surface. And as the plant begins to grow, then they gradually backfill around the corn so they end up with a root system that's like, whoa, way down. Uh, they actually grow unirrigated corn in the driest part of Arizona that I have ever seen by these techniques. You put the dust on the moisture, I guess, it gets a little damp on the bottom and it makes a seal. It just kind of keeps it from going away. I don't know. Yeah. Well, whatever. You know, they told me that the rainbow women give them desert adapted varieties at the beginning of time, and they use desert adapted practices to grow the corn. And if the corn doesn't grow, the world ends, and the world has ended several times, but the Hopi have survived it each time. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's, good. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what they told me when I asked about it, and I think I believe them. Uh, I have a question about irrigation. A friend of mine read about. Uh, Planting the tomatoes and only watering them for the first few weeks, and then you don't water them the rest of the season. She had a wonderful crop. We have seen tomatoes grown unirrigated in this town, especially the ones yeah. that come Solomino. Over at Navalais there at the yeah. gate up coming in, somebody must have thrown a McDonald's hamburger with a tomato in it or something one day. And the courtesy clerks were coming in in August one time in the unirrigated part of the landscape, bringing in tomatoes from this volunteer. I have so cherry what's tomatoes. What's happening with that? 
I mean, well, well the tomato has got a huge root system, and I think it actually manages to get itself down deep enough into the soil around here mm -hmm. under the right conditions. You know, if you water a plant frequently, it becomes dependent on what you do to it. When you don't water a plant and it survives, it has to become dependent on its own needs. And a tomato is one tough character. And I do believe, and I have seen my, with my own eyes, unirrigated tomatoes in Fremont that were successful. It can be done. This is a year to practice. See what you can do. But, but can, I, when I lived in Union City, I had a vacant lot next to my house. They let me have it to raise vegetables on. And at the bottom end of that lot was a vernal pool. It would flood every winter over in Old Alvarado, right out near the bay there, you know. And it would just flood. You couldn't do anything with it in the winter. It was underwater, and it'd be muck through half of April. But by May, I could go in and till it, and I'd plant corn on it unirrigated. And I got enough water out of that soil to be able to grow a crop of corn, sweet corn, without using water. Because it was a flood in the winter, right? So by depressing your landscapes, in a sense, if you plant your plants lower this year rather than higher, you'll probably do better. It'll help you keep the water in when you do put it down. It'll focus towards the plant where you need well, it. Well, yeah, it's a flood irrigation, and, and flood can be done with your garden hose. And that I use quite a bit of it. The edges of my garden are literally dikes so that the water cannot escape the garden. And when I go to water, a lot of times, if I'm not flooding it with an overhead sprinkler, I have been known to just take a garden hose, lay it out into the rows, berm the rows so the water can't go where I don't want it to go, and just flood the whole darn thing. That's uh, California farmers do the same thing here, too. You know, It has some advantages if you can get enough water to really flood it, because the snails don't survive. They all climb up, try to get out of the soil. You know? and so as far it has the black spots on so your yes. tomatoes and watering. Um, just a real quick. That is because the plant is going dry between the watering cycles, and so as that new fruit is forming, the baby end, or the developing end of the fruit, is running out of moisture and sometimes certain nutrients too. Calcium can be a cause of this, but we don't have any calcium deficiencies here. Okay, but it, it, the end of the plant will dry out, the end of the fruit will dry out while it's trying to grow in the middle of a hot day and so the cells die and it leaves a black patch on the end of the fruit. It's called blossom end rot. The way to eliminate it is uh, less frequent watering, deeper watering on, on less frequent intervals. Don't water as often, but water with more water. If you've been putting down one inch a day, put down uh, seven inches once a week instead. Okay. They'll train the plant to grow deeper into the soil and put a mulch on the roots. Don't leave the roots exposed to the sun. And you'll have less trouble with blossom end rot. Also, some varieties are worse. If you're trying to grow beef steaks, you're going to have more trouble. Plastic mulches, and this is something to think of this year because they do minimize uh, uh, evaporation of moisture. And we're going to be dealing with worrying about where the water's coming from this year. And so uh, consider trying to grow warm, really warm loving crops like watermelons, cantaloupes, or eggplants. Those are all real, real heat lovers. Try growing in, a, in some black plastic. And prepare your soil, unroll black plastic over it, cut slits in it, and stick the plants right in through the slits. Um, it, it, it will keep the weeds from growing. It'll hold in a little bit extra moisture that you won't be using, and the heat from the black plastic will stimulate the growth of the warm season Start plants. planting before the soil moisture begins to retreat too deep this year. That's a key. Um, look at soil moisture here as being whatever we got in the winter was all the water that we're actually naturally ever going to get. Okay, And that water gets into the earth, and as summer moves in, it trickles downward into the soil. It's slowly settling down the water table, right? Which keeps getting lower all the time. But if, when the soil moisture, like right now, is still at the surface, if you begin to apply irrigation before the moisture goes downward, then you'll maintain capillary action between the water you put on on top and the stuff that's down below. If you let it go down here so that it's dry, on the top and dry a foot down, say, you'll probably never get enough water on the top to connect to the water molecules below to create a chain. Water moves up and down in soil, not just down. It does move up because water on the top draws water upward. Okay, and so when it's dry like this, start watering early. 
because if you let it dry out before you start, you're always going to have a lens of dust between where the soil moisture is at and where you're watering. You actually use less water. Also, uh, connected to that again, if you haven't been a person that uses a mulch on your garden, whether it's a plastic mulch or it's a compost mulch or whether it's straw bales or whatever it is, this is the year. Yeah. Um, how do you know how far down the water is? Yeah, yeah well, it, if you're mulching in the summer, it's pretty simple. No, no, like you say, okay, after the winter, mm -hmm. we don't want to let the soil dry out too much. Right. So how do we know when to start watering if we've had a certain amount of water? Well, I just, by a rough guess with the way the climate looks this year, I'd probably be starting my watering this year in March. Okay. Mm-hmm. Usually I'll start in April. Okay, by the middle of April, soil moisture is when the rain stops. <laughs> as soon as the rain stops, the water starts going down. Okay, and, and, and so say in April you're putting in the tomatoes and all this stuff, and so you start to put mulches down around to keep the moisture in. If you go out into the garden in May and you kick aside your mulch, and you look down and you don't see any water on the surface if you can dig in about a knuckle or an inch or so and if you can't feel water below the mulch an inch down in the soil it's time to start watering because your water is beginning to retreat downward and when you do water you don't want just this little stuff that isn't going to work you really need to put down enough water to be able to uh, connect with the water that's below you water profusely, water well when you water. Don't water lightly.